Uh, my name is Simon Frost. I'm a parent of Annabelle Frost, and um, I've come to this conference to learn a little more about the disease. There's a lot to learn and a lot of great minds at, at this conference. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. with my wife and, and two girls. Uh, my oldest girl is six, and Annabelle, who has AHC, is three. When Annabelle was diagnosed, she was diagnosed when she was two, when she just turned two. Um, I hired a, um, a scientist that worked at the NIH for three years to work on identifying what the most logical therapies are for this disease so that we could expedite therapies for Annabelle. And um, I, we, we looked at drugs. We looked at the, the protein and the different conformations of the protein to determine whether or not drugs have a high probability of any effect. Um, obviously, we have some that do work. But um, having screened more than 10,000 in this disease already, we don't have many more that seem like viable options. Um, we looked at gene therapy. Uh, specifically gene modification therapy and, and also AAV-mediated gene therapy and identified the risks associated with both of those types of gene therapy and settled on AAV-mediated therapy as an approach that may help children that are already living with the disease. So focused a lot of time on that and have now started developing that therapy um, as a parent-led initiative. So AAV-mediated therapy is essentially taking a virus, um, packaging into that virus a string of DNA, um, and that DNA is going to be essentially a functional copy of ATP1A3, the gene that's dysfunctional in our children. Um, so putting that into the virus, and that virus is designed specifically to go to the neurons that are affect affected by this disease, and um, inject that DNA into those cells, into those neurons, and let it sit there um, like a little extra chromosome in the nucleus of those neurons and um, act like a, a little piece of DNA that, that would create the, a functional copy of the protein that um, is, is, uh, is causing the disease. You know, I, I kind of think about it as like a mosquito, <laughs> you know, a mosquito that carries a virus and, and it goes to its point of, of it, it finds a human, it injects its virus and the virus disseminates across the human body. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're injecting a functional copy of our gene um, into a human being or a mouse in this case. And, um, that is being disseminated across neurons in the brain um, and targeting specific cells to deliver its payload. And in this case, the payload is, is helpful and not hurtful. So we have um, been producing our viral vectors, which is essentially that virus with, that encapsulates the DNA um, over the last 16 weeks or so. And in the next four weeks, it should be ready for um, injection into, into mice. Um, first into mice that don't have the disease, and then into mice that do have the disease. We've got some testing to do between now and when we do inject the disease mice um, to figure out which of those viruses is the best option for us. But once we've figured that out, we're going to try it in, in diseased mice and um, see if we can copy the rescue that Dr. Clapcoat has seen using a, a different method of, of gene therapy. So this is going to cost about $750,000 um, to get to the point where we have proof of concept, which is a rescue in mice. Um, that's broken up into a couple of parts. So the first part is producing our, our virus that contains the DNA. Um, that's going to cost about $150,000 or so. We're doing additional testing outside of that to make sure that things are safe and effective, um, and that's going to cost another about $100,000. And then um, the testing in, in diseased mice is going to cost about half a million dollars. So that's our $750,000. Um, by the time we start injecting the, the diseased mice, we should know with some likelihood 
the, the chances of success. So up to this point, we've raised about $250,000. So we're, we're up to the point where we are starting to raise the capital for the mouse project for, for delivering this into diseased mice. We need to raise about a half a million dollars more. Um, we're raising money quite rapidly at this point, and we've got a lot of different AHC foundations and communities behind this this project um, and a lot of individuals that are associated with friends and family of, of the AHC community. Um, but we do need additional capital. We need that half million to, to figure out whether or not we can get a rescue in mice. So this disease is very well set up for AAV mediated therapy um, because we know certain cells are more likely to to be affected by AHC than others and we can target those cells. What we're doing here is something that can be used in other therapies. It's essentially a plug and play model, um, something that can be put on a production line. You've got a virus that is designed to be delivered to neurons in the brain uh, and that potentially could be be produced to 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 send other DNA to the same parts of the brain that that we're targeting. So neurological disorders that are monogenic that have um, a single gene associated with the disease um, can all be uh, tested for this type of therapy. And um, so far, there are you know, more than twenty diseases that have been treated with. AAV mediated therapy, many of them very successfully. Um, and there's no reason why we can't take the same approach with multiple neurological disorders. Um, in our case, we have 10 different diseases associated with ATP 103 alone that we can test for, for rescue. But we've got ATP 101 related diseases, ATP 182 related diseases, various other types of channelopathies. Um, that, that are very similar type of disorders to what we have. And then all sorts of epilepsies and um, other neurological dysfunction that can benefit from this same approach. So there are various forms of success in um, AAV mediated therapy. Um, we may be able to correct some dysfunction. We may be able to correct a lot of dysfunction, but all of our kids are suffering from things like dystonia, ataxia, um, hemiplegia, um, inability to swallow choking episodes and a lot of these come from these you know episodic unexpected events and what we are hoping to achieve is that we can slow those down or stop them um, by targeting the source of the the problem um, we we are planning to inject into a site that is very close to what seems to be the smoking gun here in terms of the the cells that are most affected by ATP 1A3 misfunction. And um, if we can stop the cells that are most affected, perhaps we can also correct a, a large number of symptoms. Um, now, obviously, that's a big dream. But even if we can correct some of them, this could be life life changing for many patients. We originally started looking for therapies because our children have a future that is not typical. Um, that That's the genesis of looking for a therapy. But what that means to me as a father is that I want my little girl to be able to sing and dance and learn and talk and swallow and eat properly and go to college and have a boyfriend and these things are beyond her in a lot of ways if she has AHC for the rest of her life. Um, beyond that, she goes through pain every two or three days. She is unable to function. We have almost lost her due to a very bad choking episode. And I think that affects more than just me as a dad, it affects my extended family, it's, it, it affects my job, it, it affects my friends, um, it affects my wife and, and our relationship. So it's a, it's a, a meaningful, life-changing thing that 
we as a community can achieve. I want it for my daughter. Um, I want it for my family, but we've got a thousand kids that could benefit from this and potentially thousands and thousands more in other similar diseases. So this type of therapy is, it's both old and it's groundbreaking. And I'll explain that. So it, this has been around for 20 years. It's been used sparsely across very few diseases, but it's worked across a large proportion of those. Um, it hasn't become mainstream yet um, for various reasons, but we want to make it more mainstream now, given the massive success that we've seen in other diseases. The most recent has been spinal muscular atrophy, where it's changed the lives of, of many children already. Um, many retinal dysfunction, um, uh, dysfunctional, I, I can't remember the name of the, the retina um, approach that was used, but it's um, people have gone from being relatively blind to being able to see. Um, in ganglia sidosis, there have been cats that have been unable to walk, unable to stand, and um, are now running around chasing little laser pointers. So this is, it changes lives, and it changes lives dramatically and quickly um, in other diseases. And um, we try to learn from that. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's groundbreaking in that it makes that change to a person's life or a community's life very, very quickly. And um, miraculously, in, in some cases. So um, it is a, it, it's, it's a high reward approach. Um, I think we have mitigated the risks now in terms of genetics where I wouldn't call it a high risk approach, uh, but it is a very high reward approach. And it's something that I think is, is worth pursuing because of that. So if we see a proof of concept in mice, if we see mice um, that are unable to walk properly, start walking properly, or unable to recognize objects and not being able to recognize them, um, we will call that a rescue. And um, if we can call that a rescue in mice, uh, we would have proven our concept. If we can prove our concept, we're going to take this to scientists in the field um, to help us to advance towards clinical trial. And the ultimate result for us would be to be able to correct this in humans. So the path towards that would be testing toxicology. And we would do that in a, in a rat study, a toxicology rat study. Um, and then after that, we, we would need to produce the viral vector, the, the, the therapy, the, the therapy that will be injected into humans at scale and at um, a very refined um, quality so that we can use it in humans. And then we would, we would go to clinical trial. So those steps are all very expensive. But once we have proven the concept, there should be sufficient capital out there and, and industry participation where we can get there both quickly and um, using funds from, from others. So we, um, we have a website, hopeforannabelle.com, uh, where we will be posting regularly our advances in this. Um, we've also participated with CureHC and AH, the AHC Foundation. Um, we've, we're all collaborating on this, and other international foundations are now getting on board. We have phone calls with those international AHC foundations on a monthly basis now, or, or a bi-monthly basis, and um, I'm providing us uh, updates, you know, very regularly to all of the AHC folks. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions directly to, I think most folks have my contact details. So um, I think so far, all of the AHC communities have been helpful in two ways. So firstly, intellectual support, providing their scientists critique on, on the path that we're taking so that we can make it better. And we've made it what I would consider very good at this point 
uh, but we could always improve upon it uh, using collaborative approach from the best scientists in the world. And the second way is to, to help us fund this. So if we can get this completed quickly, um, then we can accelerate our, our timeline to therapy.